Thank you so much all for coming out on this chilly December night when everybody's overbooked with holiday parties. Um, and uh, I uh, wanted to first turn to Peter, a little odd. Hi, Peter. <laughs> and I, yeah, I realize he's right there. Um, anyway, uh, Peter, who's joining us from New York tonight, um, and uh, Peter, after looking at these images, um, I wanted to start with you. Um, we all here have covered a lot of wars, um, and it seems what is really unique about this one is that we are overloaded with the most horrific imagery, and yet there is no foreign press corps on the ground. Um, what can you say, you know, in your mind? What is the power of these imageries, and are we kind of in danger of getting saturated by the um, ghastliness of what we're seeing um, and trying to make sense of it all? Wow, that's a, that's a difficult first question. Um, can you hear me okay, by the way? I can hear you perfectly. Go ahead. That was my face looming above the audio. That's terrifying. Okay. Well, I'll try and look away. Um, I mean, I can only really speak for myself, I think, in this case. I know as a professional photojournalist, it's a strange moment insofar as, you know, for a long time, the role uh, of people in my kind of position was to document kind of with care and thoughtfulness and some degree of courage, hopefully, the the, the situation as we saw it and all its kind of emotional complexity, but physical violence, um, you know, that role for the last few decades has been much diminished, uh, diminished to the point that that I find myself confused by quite the role I play in, 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 in events in motion. You know, while I was there in, in, in Israel in the aftermath, kind of for the New Yorker, for a major publication and a major assignment at a major moment, in the end, what I think about in a, when I think about the images that I saw that mark this are less the things I myself experienced than the things I saw on Instagram done by it, taken by anonymous people of all stripes, you know, from the perpetrators of these atrocities. And it won't be the first time that the perpetrators create the iconic images. If we think of Abu Ghraib, uh, the iconic images of the Iraq war also taken by the perpetrators of the violence or the anonymous people having happening to observe with cell phones so as visual journalists you more and more wonder what it is your role that you're playing in all this and i i don't have the answer to that i do know that looking at all this violence is both profound and incredible outside the filters of the media is both profound and incredible and deeply moving and and also disturbing to the point that it was affecting my mental health so much i had to go off social media and I've done 20 years of war correspondence and thought I'd seen it all, but this this is well beyond seeing it all. Um, Pierre, I, I wanted to turn to you because actually one of the many, you know, um, impressive things on your resume, which Emily excluded to mention, was that you are currently president of Reporter Sans Frontier, Reporters Without Borders. Um, this has been the most deadly war, if I'm not mistaken, for um, the press of any conflict that since we have been keeping track and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of journalists were killed during the Vietnam War, for example. We've lost more than 50 in two months. Um, how, uh, what does this mean in terms of how we, you know, write the history of this war? Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, it, it's a real tragedy for news, for newsmakers, for uh, uh, th for the in information world, because um, what has happened for the past two months is just incredible. We have over 50 uh, photographers, journalists, reporters, cameramen who have died uh, in uh, Gaza and in southern Lebanon. And... Uh, some of them uh, 
have died like everybody else died, you know, under the bombs, and, and they were not, uh, certainly not targeted, and they died with their families in the rubbles of their buildings or their apartments. But some of them died in the course of, of their work, and some of them even seem to have been targeted, which is even more puzzling. And I'm thinking there of one uh, Lebanese um, uh, photographer and cameraman who worked for Reuters news agency, who was killed in southern Lebanon. And Reporters Without Borders did an investigation over there. And all the elements, obviously, we are not uh, a commission of inquiry or a legal uh, panel, uh, but all the elements that we have been able to gather show that this group of media people were on a hill for more than an hour with fully uh, visible and recognizable gears from, from the media uh, in a place where there was no military setup anywhere nearby and, and no, no one uh, who would be involved in a military action would stay one hour at the same place. So, uh, and they were targeted by a helicopter, a patch helicopter from the Israeli army who was uh, doing the rounds in, the, in, the, in that area. And everything points to a, a, a direct hit that was targeted at journalists. And that's a very disturbing thing because we have not only targeted journalists, but as you mentioned, no press, uh, foreign press allowed in the Gaza Strip for the past two months. Uh, so we have to rely on the few uh, quite courageous, I must say, uh, Palestinian journalists who do work for foreign media, for AFP, for Reuters, for AP, uh, for a few uh, CNN or, or New York Times, uh, who have had stringers in the, in the Gaza Strip for, for a long time and who have experience working with them and who trust them. Uh, but still, these are people who work uh, under a lot of pressure in a very in a non uh, easy environment as you can imagine under uh, Hamas rule and 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 no foreign journalists have been allowed by uh, the Israeli army to enter the Gaza Strip so we have a, a, a real disaster also in um, in terms of information and that has a very concrete effects when the hospital was hit by a, a rocket uh, you will remember this was exactly the day when Joe Biden was going to Israel. Um, there was a lot of uh, questioning about uh, where did the heat come from, how many people died in that hospital, what were the, the real damage. No journalist was able to go on site. And so there was a lot of confusion for several days over what had really happened, which would have been cleared if, if, if there had been journalists in the Gaza Strip at that moment they would have rushed to the place and, and, and the, the every information with the available information would have been uh, possible very quickly. This didn't happen and was not uh, allowed to happen. So we have a, a real um, uh, foggy uh, situation where we rely on images and images, as, as Peter has mentioned, uh, do play a very critical role in this war. Images from all sides, uh, images taken by uh, the assailants of s October 7, uh, images uh, edited by uh, the Israeli army, images produced by Gaza residents. Uh, I follow an, uh, um, um, a Palestinian photographer who is on, on Instagram. He had uh, six or seven thousand subscribers before October 7. He now has 17 million subscribers. Uh, in within two months, and and ten times a day, he produces images from the Gaza Strip, which are terrible, as you can imagine. Uh, and okay, but these are are very significant images, but they are produced by uh, in a non-filtered uh, uh, environment, and and I think you need to have uh, open access to professional journalists in, in, uh, in this war zone uh, and that's um, really a, 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 an urgent requirement if we want to have a better understanding of what's going on. Um, I wanted to bring in Dahlia um, and Dahlia, I'm not sure where you are. Are you in Ramallah tonight or are you in Amman tonight? N no, I'm in Ramallah. You are in Ramallah? 
Um, yes. I mean, we have had tremendous reporting, thanks to you and your colleagues, out of the West Bank. And we tend to forget a little bit about the West Bank um, through this conflict. But I wanted to ask you, you wrote a piece for the New York Times um, last month saying, you know, um, for Israelis, they, they think of October 7th as being kind of like something that disrupted their life of peace. But for Palestinians, there never has been peace and that this war didn't just begin on October 7th, it has been going on for many years. Um, I wanted to ask you, from your perspective, where you are, what do you think is the long-term impact of this war on the next generation of Palestinians? Um, honestly, I, I think this war is going to have an impact not just on the next generations, it's going to have an impact on even uh, our generation. Um, I think there was a lot of work done to, um, to kind of um, bring some, at least, uh, Palestinians and Israelis uh, together uh, to make them realize that they have a, a shared fate because obviously we're sharing the same land. Um, but I, I don't know um, what kind of a shared future there is uh, from here on. Um, with everything that's been happening in Gaza, um, just the, the horrifying images of, of the children, it's, it's just hard to fathom. Um, a shared future, so to speak. Um, um, but um, I mean, the fact that you mentioned um, the West Bank, I think is important because um, the war in Gaza right now is providing cover, so to speak, um, for some dangerous things that are happening on the ground in the West Bank. Um, so um, for example, uh, the settler violence here, there's been an uptick in that, but but more, um, I don't know if it's more dangerous, but it may be the same level of danger is the fact that uh, settlers are working on displacing Palestinians. So you've got um, at least uh, a thousand people who have been displaced uh, from October 7th until now um, in the West Bank. And um, uh, the fact that nobody can do anything about it, nobody can hold Israel accountable or the settlers accountable to it is, is quite frightening. Um, I think there's also the fact that there are raids every single day, in, in uh, especially in uh, refugee camps throughout the occupied West Bank. Um, infrastructure, you know, even the basics like water pipes, um, electric poles, all these things, everything's been being bulldozed. Uh, in a way, it's kind of reminiscent of the 2002 invasion of the West Bank. And um, it's happening um, slowly but surely. So it kind of goes under the radar sometimes. Um, but yes, these are some of the things that I've been seeing here and some of the things that I worry about. Miriam, I wanted to turn to you sort of as a political scientist who has studied, correct me if I'm wrong, a kind of um, cycle of revenge in a number of conflicts. And it seems as if this is a really extreme um, version of that. Um, what seems kind of the key possibly to unraveling the cycle or getting some finding some exit out of that out of that cycle is decent leadership um and i think it's fair to say that neither side has that at this point um so can you put this in some context and point to some other conflict that we can look at which looks which resembles it or previous times in the middle east for that matter Thank you for your question. So first, maybe I would like to react to what I heard because I just would like to underline that it's even the difficulties you meet, you have, you face as journalists are even worse today for academics, historians. I mean, 
We talk a lot with my students about post-truth, and I asked them a question last time, should we get used as researchers, scholars, to post-truth as being the new normal, as being the conditions under which we research a subject, under which we write the history of conflicts in particular, which has been the core of my work. And uh, we are seeing an acceleration. Uh, we, we saw it clearly with the Syrian civil war. I think this was already a, a key, uh, a key uh, question for all of us, for my colleagues, for my students. How do we research the Syrian war? We face the same question regarding Ukraine. And today, uh, when I'm speaking about an acceleration, we are, um, we are puzzled by what's going on. And the question is, how are we going to write the history of the latest uh, Gaza war? Uh, because the fact that you have, uh, as journalists, no access to the ground is, as I said, even worse. For academics, we're facing even greater constraints, including ethical constraints, constraints in terms of security, and, and uh, constraints in terms, of course, of the objectivity and authority of the sources that we use. And we are in a notion of disinformation or misinformation, manipulation, including on social media, I'm not using social media as a source of information. I mean, I know that a lot of my students do, but we, we do have quite serious debates about should we still resort to social media when I'm seeing the levels of disinformation and manipulation. We were talking about the, imaginar the imagery of this war. We know that thanks to artificial intelligence and a number of other sophisticated technologies, everything can be manipulated. So when I was speaking about post-truth, what can we believe in today? And this is uh, a key question for a scholar, because if you can no longer believe in anything, how do you write, how do you, how do, you do your work as a social scientist? So this is just something I wanted to, to share as a, as a remark. And speaking of an acceleration, um, if revenge is the, the you know, structuring principle of today's international relations, there is also an acceleration with the Gaza war which started, let's be clear, on the 7th of October as a revenge from Hamas and a number of Palestinian militants who infiltrated uh, the Israeli territory and perpetrated these, uh, these crimes, war crimes, um, as many uh, uh, international scholars now name them. Um, I mean, we still need, of course, to take some distance and research and know what happened. Uh, we have a lot of information, but you know, this is not something you can research very easily. It takes time to qualify the crimes, to know what happened. We still don't know everything about the 7th of October. This is something important. We have not written the history of the 7th of October. Not yet. So then uh, is the question of what comes after. And well, we all saw that um, this is a war of retribution by Israel. Uh, there are a lot of debates. Uh, is this a war of vengeance? Is this legitimate retribution? You have a conflict, a war of narratives around you know, what's going on, um, which also makes it very difficult for scholars to speak. I actually have a number of colleagues uh, of mine censoring themselves because they think that whatever analysis they serve to the public at a time of social media frenzy, they will be attacked, they will be harassed. So there's, you know, this is also a big question for um, the scholarly community because whatever we say may be interpreted in a way that we do no longer master. So this is also, um, you, you see, a, a difficulty because uh, there's the politicized dimension, the highly political dimension. There's what you would like to research. There's what you can say. There's the, the public opinion. There's, at least in France, but I think it's probably the same in many countries, the highly polarized landscape that makes it extremely difficult to have any uh, rational conversation sometimes about this conflict. Um, so I'm, I'm being very challenged by what's going on. Um, Pierre, I want to ask you, um, you are looking, at, you've been looking at this for the last two months uh, every day on the radio um, uh, through the geopolitical lens. And a couple of things you've written and spoken about recently have been very interesting. The one is just, you know, Biden, and we have the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, coming out and saying, you know, they, uh, Israel has to um, take care not to, uh, you know, 
indiscriminately kill civilians, etc. Um, they've been saying this over and over again, and Macron himself came out very strongly. Um, they appear to simply be somewhat impotent in all of this. Um, and at the same time, you have Putin on his way to Riyadh and Doha to discuss the Middle East conflict. Um, and uh, what is going on? Like, is this becoming a kind of proxy war? Well, first of all, we have to remember that no one cared about the Israeli-Palestinian issue for the past 15 years. Uh, and, and today, everybody cares about it. So we have a situation where, strangely enough, the worst tragedy, which is what happened on the, uh, October 7th, has put back this issue at the center of world attention. And, and that's not a, a small achievement for Hamas, which the Palestinians are grateful uh, for, because uh, there was an opinion poll uh, in, in the Palestinian, uh, in the West Bank and Gaza the other day, and Palestinians were asked, who is defending the Palestinians in the world? The first answer was no one. 56% were say, said no one. Second was Russia, 15%, so that's already quite a big difference, but still Russia. And the, the Arab world, 8%. So this gives a, a little bit what was the situation in, in, in the world, that no one cared and the Palestinians felt completely uh, forgotten and more uh, so with the Abraham ag agreements signed by Israel with a, few, a number of uh, Arab countries, and they were about to sign with Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Crown Prince himself said recently on, on US TV that uh, they were very near an agreement. And those agreements didn't include anything for the Palestinians. So today we have a, a, a world mobilization of diplomatic energy, and everybody is saying again this mantra, the two-state solution, uh, which People were repeating, it was like, the, you know, uh, uh, an already set phrase in every s diplomatic statement, but no one uh, believed in it for, for the past uh, 15 or 20 years. So we have today a situation where uh, all the world powers are coming to the region, uh, the US, France, uh, the Europeans, the uh, uh, everybody went to Israel just immediately after October 7. Now Putin is on his way, as you said, to the Gulf countries, uh, which is interesting because he's still under, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, International Court of Justice um, and, uh, asking for his arrest uh, for crimes, but he's still received in the United Amer uh, Arab Emirates and in, in Saudi Arabia. And the Iranian president will be in Moscow on, on Thursday. So, so we have this this... A uh, big mobilization, and no one really sees where it's leading. Uh, first of all, because uh, no one really has any influence on 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 those on on the local actors. Uh, and and Joe Biden is is a, is a good case because he's been saying pretty um, you know a few good things, like when he was in in uh, with uh, Netanyahu at the press conference in Tel Aviv and he said uh, don't do the same mistakes that we did after 911 uh, this was pretty smart uh, uh, I, I would have uh, I thought at that time uh, but the israelis didn't listen it didn't have much effect no it didn't have any effect and now he's saying you know you have to take care protect the civilians uh, change your strategy i mean blinken was in 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 israel last week his third trip in, in two months. Uh, Lloyd Austin, as you said, Kamala Harris said the same thing. So we have the top US leaders telling Israel, you cannot continue uh, killing civilians that way. You know, it's not a, r the right way to destroy Hamas because the US agrees with the objective uh, and, and of and uh, just destroying Hamas. Also say, I mean, Israel would not be able to prosecute this war without the US. But that's the big contradiction. Uh, and, and Israel knows that the US is not going to turn against it. It's not going to let it down. It's not going to 
stop delivering ammunition to the Israeli army and is not going to stop protecting Israel uh, in the region. Look what's going on in the Red Sea. You know, you have uh, the, the shipping lane on the Red Sea is under attack from the Houthis from Yemen. And it's the US fleet that is protecting uh, that lane, that is stopping some drones. Uh, and it's a very dangerous situation over there. And, and the, the mobilization of the US Army, two aircraft carriers, a nuclear submarine, uh, you know, uh, special forces uh, deployed in the region. I mean, this is unprecedented. Uh, and, and this has probably played a role in keeping the conflict local and minimizing the risk uh, uh, because the message was uh, to, uh, to Iran, uh, if, if something happens with Hezbollah, uh, the Iranian territory will be involved in, in this war. And uh, uh, the, uh, the Kamala Harris, who, who, who we don't hear a lot, I must say, um, uh, we haven't heard a lot for the past three years, uh, had a very good line uh, on, on in an interview on US TV. She was asked, what's the US message to Iran? And she said one word, don't. Mm. Which uh, doesn't work in French, actually. We have to make a whole <laughs> sentence. <laughs> we, we don't have that... Uh, uh, kind of uh, I wonder if it works uh, in Farsi. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but to 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 answer your question, the, the, uh, there is a sense of of uh, um, helplessness with with this this gap between the, those big powers. You mentioned Macron, but Netanyahu doesn't care about what Macron says. You know, he, he certainly cares about what what Joe Biden says, but he doesn't care about the Europeans uh, uh, in general. Uh, and 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 his right to uh, not to care, <laughs> um, because we have no real uh, weight, uh, and we are so obsessed with the impact of the conflict in our society that we're not going to do anything uh, dramatic in in that region. But but the Americans do have an influence and do have the means to to weigh on on the the way this war is being waged, and it's not using it yet. We, we, we'll have to see, but for the moment it's, it's a pretty uh, curious scene where uh, the U.S. is saying, you know, stop killing civilians and, and Israel says we're going to be at war for months and we're sending the ground forces and, uh, and they're not changing anything to their strategy, uh, which, is, um, which says a lot about uh, this world we're in at the moment. Um, Dahlia, I'm wondering from your perspective on the West Bank, um, where are the signs of hope? I mean, are there, is there a sense among some people that ho as, as horrific as this war is, um, something might come out of it that would be positive, a change of leadership? Um, a new realignment on, you know, serious negotiations for a Palestinian state, um, or is that does that feel like a pipe dream right now? Yeah, I, I um, sorry to be the bearer of uh, bad news, but no, there's nothing good to come out of this because. Right now, if you look at the ground, the sentiment uh, permeating in, in the West Bank, uh, I, I won't speak for the Gaza Strip because that's uh, a different case, but the, the one in the West Bank is one of loneliness and isolation and also vulnerability. Um, I think Palestinians know that nobody will protect them and they see all of the weaknesses in their leadership, you know, um, it's aloof, it's too dependent on major international players, and they have no one to speak up for their humanity and their right to security, life, and dignity. I think they're also angry at the West, which has spent years pontificating about human rights and international law only to stand out as hypocrites, because when the proverbial and literal dust settles in Gaza, the same countries that sent military support to Israel will also be sp spending money to provide traumatized Palestinians with counseling and maybe to contribute to rebuilding Gaza, if that's even possible at all. I mean, I, um, I mean, Gaza still has rubble from 
probably, you know, three, three wars back. And here lies the crux of this conflict. If they would have fulfilled their responsibilities as um, interlocutors uh, working for Palestinians' best interests, I don't think this would have ever happened in the first place. Um, I think also, uh, if we were to talk about, you know, the mood, um, I think the, the mood in the West Bank uh, oscillates between charged and, and cautious. Like I mentioned earlier, there's a fear that there will be something akin to the 2002 Israeli invasion that destroyed much of the West Bank. And I think a repetition of that invasion um, is um, the specter in, in people's minds um, because this is what they know. This is what they went through. And a, a lot of us, myself included, went through this as well. I will say that um, also Palestinians do not have confidence in the Palestinian leadership, as, as Pierre uh, sort of mentioned earlier. Um, there were demonstrations uh, against uh, Israel's bombardment in Gaza, but some of the anger has been directed against the PA president. Um, but, you know, and, and the fact that um, Anthony Blinken and other, and Macron and other um, um, leaders have gone to speak to Abbas is kind of laughable in a way. I mean, there's nothing funny at the moment, but I mean, we're talking about someone who's 87 years old. He's been presiding over the PA since 2005. He's weak and unpopular. He sabotaged several opportunities for local e elections to find a successor. And yet we find um, the Americans, the Europeans going to speak to him like he somehow has an authority or, um, or anything to contribute to the, to the situation. W what he's doing at the moment is, pl is playing the, the waiting game, which is the game that he constantly plays when there's nothing he can do. He, he can't outwardly um, come out and speak against Hamas because people will go after him and um, not in the physical sense, but, you know, um, they'll criticize him. But at the same time, um, you know, he's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place and he's kind of waiting, uh, waiting it out. He, he believes that he's going to outlive all of us and uh, that's his game at the moment. So no, I'm sorry. I don't see any, anything bright in the future. The only way we can see anything bright is if there's a ceasefire if um, the Americans um, um, work their magic and, and push the Israelis into accepting a ceasefire, I think that's a starting point. And then from there on, we're, we, we have to have humanitarian aid going into Gaza. Um, and the, the long road to rebuilding um, will begin then. But um, I'm not sure how that any of that is going to happen. Um. We, we started this uh, evening looking at Peter's photographs um, from the region, and those were taken as over a number of years, over about 11 years, I think. Is that correct, Peter? Yep, that's correct. And, um, you know, I just wanted to say in relation to that, and Peter, then I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts about this, but we are so... Um, bombarded um, with Im images that, you know, um, two months back might have seemed unimaginable to us. Um, now we turn on the TV and they seem somewhat normal. We're looking at entire neighborhoods that have essentially been obliterated, um, neighborhoods that I know all of us have been in, in Gaza City and Jabalia and so on. Um, and Pierre, before we sat down to talk, you were talking about how, you know, back in the day you could drive into Gaza and have, you know, seafood on the beach and drive back to Jerusalem for, you know, dinner. And um, and this, you know, the just to kind of stop for a moment and think about how 16,000 people are reportedly killed in this conflict in two months, um, including thousands of children. We're not quite sure 
how many, um, total collapse of health infrastructure, um, and and actually a hun more than 130 UN aid workers I found today, also the highest death toll for the UN of any conflict, and that's an awful lot of conflicts. Um, so Peter, I'm wondering from you and your colleagues, um, photographers, um, when you finally are able to get back to the Middle East and get back and get into Gaza, what are the images you think you could capture that would move people, you know, have some kind of lasting impact? Um, I mean, I think images and their meaning are, are always unpredictable. Um, and, and so much is uh, out of control of the intention of the photographers. I mean, that being said, I mean, to my mind, you know, I grew up as I grew up in the United States. Uh, I grew up with a certain vision of photographing the Middle East or photographs of the Middle East that largely showed Arabs in distress, in pain, uh, violence being done to their body, them perhaps doing violence to others. And that was my almost the entirety of my vision as filtered through uh, the framework of photojournalism. As I started covering the American wars uh, almost 20 years ago and making my own relationship with Arab society, I found that the reality of what I was seeing and experiencing was profoundly different from the things that I'd been exposed to leading up to my choices to go cover these wars. So, so my journey in a sense as a photographer has been a process of, of re-education. So what I, which means looking at war, both to show it's the horrific violence of it, but within that framework, you know, the, the deep importance of kind of showing the, the humanity behind it. That's what photography is good at. That's the, in some ways, the unique role it can play in the hands of an experienced practitioner is to show that kind of common humanity, that deep beauty, these little subtle things that resonate well beyond the sum of their parts. And so I would plan on doing that. That would be the small role I would want to play and 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 in the end right now you know well it is deeply troubling that that foreign journalists are not allowed into Gaza Gazan journalists are are doing an extraordinary job uh, documenting the consequences of this conflict we have taught in the Middle East for many years have two former students you know this one of them is just kind of taking care of his family and and in a way, his and isn't photographing much, but in a way, the record he is sending is just as powerful as what he would see. And that's a record of his face every day with his beard growing longer, his eyes growing more tired and more haggard, but his smile growing more stilted, you know. And in a way, that that narrative of selfies is as powerful a record of the violence on one person who's surviving it, but at what costs you know we heard another story from another one of our former students who has uh, a few, four sons and every time she's in a hospital photographing she's with one eye looking trying to compose the frame and the other eye looking uh, are one of those children coming into the hospital or one of her sons and so the enormity of this of to document this thing while having your family affected, having your family killed at risk of death yourself for weeks and months on end, I mean, it is an, it is an extraordinary act of kind of courage and 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 commitment to to uh, telling what's happening. So sorry to shift it from me to them, but I'd rather rather not talk about myself under these circumstances. You know? Absolutely, yeah, no, quite unbelievable. Um, I'm just wondering if we ought to open it up to questions at this point. We should also note that, uh, Peter, I know you have a hard out in 10 minutes, so if anyone has questions for Peter specifically, um, better ask them quickly. Yeah, if you just have a question, raise your hand, then I'll bring you the microphone. We'll start with questions for Peter, if anyone has them. All right, they might come later. Uh, general questions, then. Um. I know there was a lot of criticism directed towards Israel tonight, and I was wondering why you didn't have an Israeli correspondent or journalist as part of this forum. Do 
not for lack of trying. <laughs> we were supposed to have one who unfortunately had a cancel, um, but uh, you know, I think that you ask a very good question, and I think one should not forget the total horrors of October 7th, and some of those horrors still emerging, obviously, in the last couple of days. We've heard a lot more about the sexual violence perpetrated on October 7th, which has been absolutely blood-curdling. Um, and, uh, yeah, unfortunately, we, um, we have the panelists that we have tonight. Fortunately, as well, they are lovely. Thank you. Yes. I, I realize this isn't exactly within the subject of what you've been talking about tonight, but do you think Biden will pay a political price for his his, his embrace of Netanyahu in the in, in the elections next year? I mean, I I guess I should ask you, Pierre, what do you think from your geopolitical perspective? I mean, personally, I think that. Biden is going to be facing such a, you know, wall of challenges that this one is going to be pretty minor. Um, but what do you think? Well, I'm not American, so I'm not uh, as intimate with the American political life as you are. But I'm I'm really um, surprised, I must say, by the, the debate in the U.S. and how um, how much uh, of the youth has turned uh, in favor of the Palestinians, and and the polls, the opinion polls about the um, under 34, which said that 70 percent of the under 34 in the U.S. don't support Biden on on Israel, um, is, is is quite amazing. I must say, I, I was I would never have predicted that or guessed that, and so that. I, I don't know, you know, it's still a long way to the election and, and so much can happen. But uh, it, it is a very risky situation in probably in some uh, states uh, to have lost um, at this stage. Um, and a lot of things can happen. But to have lost uh, the youth, then the youth maybe doesn't vote as much as the older generation, so it might not have uh, such an impact. So I'm, I'm really puzzled by that, but I'm still surprised by how much uh, hostility there is in, in a quite a large part of the population, and, and particularly the youth, um, uh, to, uh, to the, that support to Israel, which I thought was more widespread in the US and more uh, dominant. And in many ways, the the way the debate is happening in the in the uh, universities, par particularly, is also very puzzling for an outsider because uh, the the violence of of that debate and and sometimes not so well informed, I must say, from what I can read or or, or see, um, is uh, the other day I was looking at the at the. Uh, video which was interesting uh, people were shouting uh, from the river to the sea Palestine will be free you know that slogan and so someone asked the students who were shouting that which river and which sea and 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 and, and none of them <laughs> was able to to answer uh, I know Americans are not good at geography but still <laughs> this is political geography and uh, and so they, they should be better informed uh, before uh, shouting such a slogan. Someone said the Euphrates, uh, which is uh, uh, quite a long way. Um, I think Peter wanted to respond to this as well. Oh, so, uh, I may be too, too late for the previous point, but there's a question about the why there wasn't an Israeli on the panel. I, I just did want to mention something about being um, a Jew on the panel and, and the, the profound pain of kind of trying to hold two truths simultaneously, you know, the truth of what I witnessed in the kibbutzim after October 7th, uh, the interviews I did with the with survivors of people whose children had been kidnapped and loved ones had been kidnapped, the testimonies from the forensic specialists of the sexual violence, all these things were amongst the worst testimonies and sites I'd ever seen. And then, of course, you know, and then, so to grieve that, to grieve that as a as a, as a Jew and grieve it as a human being, and 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 also to be a journalist, uh, 
you know, and that that requires the thoughtfulness of 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 also looking and considering both sides. And so I don't think there, I guess it's a long way of saying, I don't think there's this intentionality of sort of denying that that the the many layers of of the Israeli and Jewish experience and all this, but simply that at this stage of the conflict and the difficulty of sometimes getting people on the panel, it, it alters the the nature of the conversation, you know, but not not nefariously. At least I can say that for myself. Thank you uh, for that, Peter. Um, we have a, a question on Zoom as well from Catherine. Catherine has said, I'm disturbed about the bias and the information we are getting wherever we live. Uh, and she specified she lives in France. How can we get a balance of information from different reliable news sources, given that there are no international journalists from anywhere on the ground in Gaza? Um, you know, uh, they say that journalism is the first draft of history, and in some ways that is really a kind of apt phrase here. Um, but journalism is not what journalism was um, during World War II or you know other great wars where you had scribes and you know journalism is being kind of created on social media. Um, Mary, maybe I should turn to you. I mean, how, where, you're a political scientist, your profession is to try dissect things in the most kind of, I guess, uh, you know, rigorously objective way. Where can you find that objectivity here? Well, going back to your previous question, to the previous cycles of confrontation, violence, revenge that took place that I think informs us quite a lot. Oh, it's working. Uh, that, in, that provides us with information about, so the past says quite a lot about the present. I'm not saying that this war has not its uh, specificities, including the difficulty to access information, the difficulty for journalists, reporters, but also, as I said, scholars to to do um, field investigations. So uh, this is very challenging indeed. The question, I think, in the long run is, are we going to reach a level of truth? And so you were asking us, uh, you were asking us why, um, you know, about the composition of this panel, and it's quite interesting that we feel that we should have, you know, certain um, people represented to speak about a conflict which, in my view, is universal, which has spoken to the whole world, which questions, uh, uh, you know, the current trends in international relations quite significantly and beyond uh, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, framework. Uh, so I think this is also quest quite interesting. Um, I'm very, as I said, I'm very critical of social media. I try to avoid social media because I've seen levels of, as I said, disinformation, manipulation that are very worrying and uh, that are quite a problem, at least for uh, scholarly research. So in this case, what do my students do? For instance, those willing to write about what's going on, they turn to um, what's available, solid research, uh, they do use, um, of course, what journalists write, but we are very selective in what we read and what we uh, exploit as secondary resources. The problem being that we need also to work with primary sources, and as I said, it's becoming very difficult. I mean, at for Gaza, it's almost impossible. The West Bank, you still have researchers doing research, but you know, how long are we going to be able to do a good research? It's always been very challenging. It's not the first time. Um, there, there would be a lot to say, but it, I, I would, you know, just to finish, um, I, I still think that, you know, by maneuvering between all these constraints and difficulties, there is still a way to approach some truth or some, what I would consider to be um, serious interpretations of what, what's going on. But I don't think anybody has the truth. And, you know, I was referring to the 7th of October. Yes, we have a level of documentation about the war crimes perpetrated by Hamas, but not everything. We have not heard everybody. Uh, we do not have the necessary distance to appreciate what happened. And it's going to be even more difficult for Gaza, given everything we said, the levels of devastation, the trauma. I mean, people are not going to speak to us. I don't think that you know Palestinians in Gaza are going to be willing to speak to 
to share everything. Um, and we are not in the aftermath. So this is really what's worrying me because in a few weeks we have reached such levels of devastation. You were also asking me how do we um, come out of this. Um, the war will stop, but uh, what will remain um, is not very, uh, does not make me very optimistic for the future, including uh, about the conditions of, as I said, research, objective research in uh, this specific context. Uh, and by the way, I mean, when I spoke about the normalization of some of these horrors, um, you know, I actually forgot to mention the fact, and this is quite kind of extraordinary, that there are something like 135 hostages still in captivity. And that's almost like um, a footnote at this point. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And I know, Peter, you have to run he for he has his hand to raised get to. If he wants uh, a last word. Pardon? Never mind. I didn't have my hand raised. I forgot to lower oh, it. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm. I, I know you have a bus to catch to Washington, and so, and you've told me you've got to get out of here, like, I think now, right? Um, and Dolly said yeah. she's going to have yeah. to go as well. Unless someone is desperate for my uh, insights, uh, I'll, uh, I'll take my, my leave. Uh, we can continue, of course, but uh, Peter, I, I think we'd better get on your way. I think we'll thank just... You. The bus driver will, will, will thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, Pierre, uh, you wanted to pick up. Yes, I, w I want to jump on that question about how do we get information. Because I spend most of my days for the past two months uh, researching information and trying to make sense of, of what's happening on a, on a daily basis for my work. And, and I think one basic element is try to go in everybody's head, that uh, mind. Uh, that means um, we are under a lot of emotions uh, in which you are being pushed to choose whose death you're going to cry for, um, forgetting about the other side's death. You have to choose the narrative. You have to choose the history. Y you know. I'm, I'm struck by one thing. Uh, um, the the uh, I, I'm Jewish myself. To be uh, to to make a, a statement like Peter said, uh, and when I was a I was a correspondent in in uh, in Jerusalem uh, at the time of Oslo in '93, and uh, I organized a dinner at my home between two academics, one Israeli and one Palestinian, who had expressed wish to meet. It was after the, 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 the agreement was signed, there was a lot of op optimism, everybody thought, uh, this is it, you know, we're going to have peace. And the Palestinians started by saying, you know, we uh, should try to understand what are the traumas in, in the other side's uh, minds. And he said, uh, we have underestimated the Holocaust uh, for Jews, because we've always felt that this was a European issue, it was not our problem, and we never cared about it. And he said, we have to understand how important it is in the Jewish uh, history, in the Jewish you know, uh, uh, fears and, and existential um, uh, mind. And, and so the, the Israeli was very happy with that statement. And then he said, but you also have to understand our trauma, and that is the Nakba, the, the the expulsion of, of Palestinians in 1948. And suddenly the Israeli guy um, you know, didn't, didn't like it because he said, you cannot put on the same level six millions of, of Jews killed and the expulsion of the Palestinians, which was not the point. Uh, it was understanding what are the traumas on each side. And I thought about it the other day because all of a sudden everybody says, you know, October 7 is the, no the highest number of Jews killed since the Holocaust. And on the other side, the Palestinians look at the images from Gaza and say, it's a new Nakba, or it's an ongoing Nakba. And, and so the worst nightmares of each side, each people, is coming back to, to the forefront. And, and I think that's a, something we outsiders, even if we have connections to that region, should understand. And, and it should help us 
to understand the, 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 the flow of news, of biased news, of, t of t uh, manipulated news that are coming out from that region, is to understand what is the frame that is shaping uh, each side. Because at the moment, each side is unable to look at the other one. Uh, the Palestinians are, are full of their own tragedy, and the Israelis are full of their own tragedy, and no one is looking at what the other side is experiencing, and, and, and that's part of the uh, unfortunate equation of, of today. And I think that's part of our way of trying to get exact news, or, or, or uh, I don't like the word truth because I, <laughs> I'm not sure uh, there is a truth. Uh, I hope there is a truth, but how can we approach the truth in such a, a foggy situation? It's too, too, but, but at least we can get some, some uh, honest approach of the situation through understanding uh, the history, the traumas, the, uh, uh, the missed opportunities, the, the failures, the, the, the flows of, uh, of leadership. You asked about the leadership. We have to understand today all the things we don't know. And one of the things we don't know is who's going to be the leaders of Israel and who's going to be the leaders of the Palestinians once this war is over. Because we have failed leaderships on both sides, as Dalia said. Uh, uh, Netanyahu and his uh, far-right coalition ha are uh, rejected today by the Israelis. You know, it's the first time I see in a war the leadership is, is uh, so low in opinion polls. Netanyahu has get, is getting less than 10% support in the uh, Israeli population. And, and his far-right allies are um, condemned by everybody in Israel for their provocations uh, that have inflamed the, the, the West Bank. And on the other side, as has been eloquently said, Mahmoud Abbas is, is discredited at the end of the road, and, and Hamas is, is what we, we see. So there will be a different leadership in, on both sides. What will be the impact of this war on uh, the political elite or landscape on both sides, we still don't know. Um, can have some ideas. There's a lot of talk about Barghouti on the Palestinian side. There's uh, Benny Gantz, who thinks he's the, the new king in, in the making on the Israeli side. But still, uh, I, I don't think uh, anything is written already. <laughs>